All good, all good. Hey, if you've got a um, collection of ancient documents there that we call a Bible these days, can you open it up with me, please, to Luke chapter 10? Um, you probably don't have one because most people don't carry Bibles on them anymore. It's usually on our phone or whatever. So if you've got your phone or something there, I trust you. But if you bring your phone out, I trust that you're looking at the Word of God. Uh, and if you're not looking at the Word of God and you're in this section, you're going to get picked up on the camera and I'll notice it later. Um, just a warning, just a hint, letting you know. Although maybe not now because we have raised the cameras up. You can probably get away with Facebooking while I'm talking. Uh, Luke chapter 10. Um, hey, who, who's an easily distracted person in this room? We've got any people that are easily distracted? So you weren't even looking at me when you raised your hand. I'm asking, is anyone easily distracted? You're looking up there doing this. So, you know, anyone else like that? Anyone easily distracted person by nature? I'm a, I can be an easily distracted uh, person by nature, I would imagine. I can... Um, I was just thinking this week about the types of distractions and things that happen to us. Um, I can get distracted from work by social media. Anyone like that can get distracted from work you should be doing by Honest Shelley. The rest of you, I'd like to pray for you afterwards. Uh, there's two of you. Uh, or cat videos on YouTube. Anyone watch cat videos on YouTube? We get distracted from work. We should be doing work, but that phone's going off and we're checking things out. We can be distracted from cleaning by things you find around the house. Anyone? Yep, Judy, you understand? Yep, Shelly again. You are a very distracted person, Shelly. That's two out of two. Distracted when you're cleaning. Say you're getting around the house and you're cleaning things and then you find something that you, yeah, that you lost or you didn't know was there and, oh, you pick it up and you're playing and, you know, reminiscing and so on and you've been totally distracted from what you started out to do, which was to clean the house. What about uh, walking from A to B? Who's ever been distracted by their own reflection? <laughs> you're walking past the microwave. Come back. Oh, that... Ooh, looking good, you know? No? Look, 40% of you males do it. I know you do. Statistics don't lie. Um, what about who's been distracted from a diet by food? Please, please, burger rings. Burger rings and chicken twisties. That's, that's, that's what this is. I blame this on burger rings, chicken twisties, and zinger burgers. Bacon and cheese, zinger burgers. Uh, some things are easier to break out of than others. Who's ever been distracted from exercise by looking at a comfortable lounge chair? Yep, yep, awesome. There we go. Thanks for your honesty. Easily distracted people, different types of distractions. Who's ever been distracted from study or from opening up the Word of God because of a series on Netflix or the cricket was on? Eh? Okay, thank you. I think I've pretty much covered most people here in some type of distraction. If, you, if I didn't cover your distraction, I've got no doubt that there are times in life where each of us have found ourselves distracted. And that, my friends, is a segue into what we're going to talk about here, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we've got the story of these two ladies called Mary and Martha. Exactly right. Two ladies, Mary and Martha. And the story goes like this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So Jesus is not traveling by himself to this town of Bethany, through this town. It says that he's with a group of disciples. We don't know who they were. We don't have their names or numbers. We just know that he's with a group of disciples. Often when the Bible talks about the disciples, it can talk about the 12. Sometimes when it talks about disciples, it's talking about a much larger group than just 12. What we do know is that these disciples were followers of Jesus. So Jesus is walking along with a bunch of his followers and he comes to the home of this woman called Martha. And we know from reading uh, uh, this passage here, but also in the book of John, we know that Martha had a sister, Mary, and we read about her here. We also know they had a brother called Lazarus. Exactly, Lazarus. They had a brother called Lazarus as well. And this situation, Jesus comes along. So we, we, we gather that Jesus is fairly acquainted with this family from the pictures we get in the Gospels of his relationship to Mary and Martha and his love for Lazarus. There's a level of relationship here. And so Jesus is traveling along. He comes to their house. And it says in verse 39 that Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, I want you to understand something. In a nutshell, this passage, when we talk about it and think about the passage, we think about two things. We think about a woman called Mary and we think about a woman called Martha, right? And we think about a woman called Martha who's just really, really busy. She's too busy to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. And we think about a woman called Mary, and Mary is doing the right thing, and she's sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening, or the word actually means absorbing. 
the teachings of Jesus and so on. And we, we kind of look at this passage as a picture of being just too busy or not too busy to spend time with Jesus. Anyone ever heard it preached that way? It's, it's a great application. It's 100% true. But I want to dig a little deeper and go a little bit further behind the scenes. You see, the busyness, I don't think the busyness in this passage is the root of the problem. Busyness is the fruit of the real problem of what's going on in this passage here. Now, at the very beginning, the gospel writer Luke makes it very clear what's happening in this moment. He says she had a sister called Mary, and what's Mary doing? It says that Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Now, if you're from a Jewish background, you would understand that what Luke is describing and what's being highlighted in that verse is a picture of what it means to be a disciple of a rabbi. It's a picture of what discipleship looked like in those days and what it meant to follow a rabbi, a teacher. Uh, Do you remember in the book of Acts when Paul talks about his journey to faith and his life with God? And he talks about before coming to Christ, he says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Anyone anyone ever read that? I think Acts 25, maybe somewhere in there. He says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. In other words, uh, as a disciple, what I would do is I would have my rabbi, my teacher, and I would literally sit at the feet of my teacher, my rabbi. And I wouldn't just listen. See, what we do today is we kind of listen to the Word of God and then what we do is we then decide whether we want to run with it or whether it's true. or We 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 then listen to it and then we just decide. But back in Jesus' time, if you followed a rabbi, you sat at his feet and you didn't just listen. The the Greek word where it says Mary's listening means she's absorbing it. She's taking in everything that Jesus is teaching into herself to become a part of who she is. There was an old saying uh, in, 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 uh, in, in sort of this time with rabbis, and that was that you, you sat at the feet of a rabbi, and if you didn't know how to interpret a passage of Scripture, you just believed whatever your rabbi said. That's what you did. You, you, you took on board the rabbi's interpretation, became your interpretation. That's how serious they were about sitting at the feet of a rabbi and learning the law of God, the Torah, and the word of God, and so on. And so what we've got here is this unreal, unbelievable picture of a group of people, like, like it said, there were many people traveling with Jesus and his disciples. So Mary's not, it's not a picture of, of Jesus sitting uh, on a chair teaching and one person, Mary, sitting at his feet. There's a group of people in this room. But what's so amazing and countercultural in this moment is that females did not sit at the feet of a rabbi. Females did, did, didn't have the opportunity to sit at the feet of a teacher and be discipled by them. It just was so countercultural to the day that Jesus was in. Now, now we know now in hindsight, we look back and we see there's probably never been a, 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 a figure in human history who has gone so against culture and against the grain to fight for the rights of women as Jesus did. Now, we read it now 2,000 years later and just go, this is normal. But in the moment, this was not normal. Now, what amazes me is that not only is Mary sitting comfortably at the feet of Jesus, a woman sitting at the feet of Jesus being discipled, but what's happening is all these other disciples around her, a majority of whom would have been males, nobody is complaining about it. They're comfortable with it. They're comfortable with it. So what we're seeing here is... Already at this point in the gospel story, already at this point in Jesus' journey, Jesus was very countercultural. Jesus didn't come and just slip into the slipstream of the culture he was in at the time. Jesus did things that were outside the box of culture. Because not only is there an earthly culture that we live in down here, not only do our nations have a culture, not only does our community have a culture, Not only does your church you go to, the gathering, have a culture. Not only does your family within your home, we have a culture, a way that we do things, a way we look at things. But the kingdom of God has a culture as well. There's a kingdom culture that Jesus came to bring to earth. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. It's interesting, one of the parts of the Lord's Prayer is, is, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And your will be done, where? On earth, as it's already being done in heaven. So there's a culture, there's a way of doing things that God does things. There's a a set of values and ethics and a way and a set of priorities in the kingdom. 
And it's so important that it come down here to earth that Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, said, this needs to be part of what you're praying for. That kingdom, those ethics, those values, those priorities of the kingdom of God, I want you to pray that those things would come to earth. How do they come to earth? They come to earth when they're lived out by God's people. When we live them out in the face of a culture that might not necessarily agree with everything that we're living out. When we live them out in the face of a culture that might not want to run around and high-five us because of the stance we take or the way we live our life. Because we, 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 we do, what's that phrase? We dance to the beat of a different drum. Anyone ever heard that phrase? Yeah? We dance to the beat of a different drum than the world around us. The world around us is, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we, you know, there's a passage here that says we're aliens and strangers. Anyone read that in one of the lists? We're aliens and strangers. I don't, I don't mean like, you know, walk around like ET, phone home and be weird. And, but, but culturally, we have to acknowledge that when we come to faith, we have a different culture. These, these people that are following Jesus up to this point, I don't know what, 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 how long they're walking with Jesus. We don't know how long till this happens. What we do know is by the time they get to this scenario, there's a woman sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is so countercultural to the earthly culture they're in, but very much in line with kingdom culture, where there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. God values all of us and uses all of us. And by the time we get to this picture, there's this, this situation here where we're seeing Jesus going against culture. Now, that's the backdrop for the rest of the passage. We're already seeing in these two verses, Jesus is doing something culturally that is in line with kingdom culture, not necessarily going to be accepted by earthly culture of the day, but it's in line with kingdom culture, and Jesus is living it out in such a way that people see it. So Martha opens a home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. Watch this, but Martha was what? Distracted. Let me tell you something about distraction. Here's the thing. You cannot be distracted unless you actually know what you're meant to be focusing on in the moment. Otherwise, how do you know that that's a distraction? Right? You, you, you don't know that. How do I know that that cat video on YouTube is a distraction? The only reason I know it's a distraction is because I should have been working and sending an email to my boss, or I should have been digging a hole, or I should have been fixing a car, but instead I'm over here looking at cat videos on YouTube. That's how I know it's a distraction. Now, if I wasn't meant to be fixing my car or digging a hole or sending an email to my boss, it's not necessarily a distraction, is it? Because it's not pulling me away from anything that I should have been doing. Now, the passage says here, Martha was distracted. In other words, deep down inside, Martha knew she should be doing something else other than what she was doing. Right? Martha knew. She looks at Mary sitting there, and I think that Martha inside goes, I know that that is kingdom culture right there. Taking time, sitting at the feet of Jesus, being with him, listening to him. But my natural culture tells me that I have to be out here serving and being hospitable to the guest that comes into my home. So what we're seeing here is a clash of cultures. Mary sits at his feet. Mary goes against culture. Mary, if, if, we were to, if we were to be back in the day, like we read this story 2,000 years on, right? Mary is the hero. Martha is the villain. Boo, yes, Martha. That's 2,000 years later. If you're in the moment, in the culture, the roles are totally reversed. Martha's the hero because she's doing culturally what she's meant to do. Mary's the villain. Boo, hiss, get up, you lazy lady. Serve. That's what culture in the day would have thought. We read it now, 2,000 years on, and go, no, no, we understand Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, being with him. She's the hero. And we read Martha as the villain. But in that culture and in that moment, it was the total opposite. Mary was the villain. And Martha was the hero. What we're seeing in this passage is a clash of cultures. There's this culture on earth down here that tries to set your priorities, tries to set your boundaries, tries to tell you what's, what your priorities should be, tries to tell you what's right, tries to tell you what's wrong. But we're living in this kingdom culture where sometimes, quite often, God's values and ethics and priorities are different to what the world is screaming at us every day. And we, like Martha know what we probably should be doing, we know what we should be prioritising, know where we should be spending our time, our money, know where we should be putting our, making our ethical stands, know where we should be setting our values, but we're distracted because we've got a world screaming at us saying, no, no, this is how you do it. 
And so what this passage is about, it's this clash of cultures. Martha is busy doing what she's doing. What she's doing is not the problem. Someone comes to your house and you make them a cup of tea. It's not a problem, right? That's not an issue. It's actually a good thing. It was a good thing. The problem is not, not, not that she's too busy. That that's just the fruit of the tree. The root of the problem is her inability. Her inability in the moment to go, what is kingdom culture demanding of me here? It's not often Jesus in person walks into your lounge room and sits down. You know? It's not often that happens. The Messiah comes. It's not often. Martha, put the tea towel down. Just put it down in this moment. It doesn't make you a bad person, but it's not every, every, every day that Jesus walks into your house physically and sits down and wants to teach. So get in that room, sit down, and listen to what your master wants to say to you. Listen to what your master wants to say to you. So Jesus is challenging culture even way back then. Here's a question for you. Which kingdom dictates the priorities that we are prepared to live in down here? Which kingdom takes precedence in your life and dictates the priorities and the values and the worldview that you carry throughout your day and the places that you go. See, Mary, traditionally, we preach Mary as the hero. And we know she is, but culturally, she was the villain. And the opposite is true for Martha. See, being too busy was the fruit of Martha's problem. It wasn't the root of Martha's problem. Martha was distracted. That word distracted in the Greek, it literally means this. And and by the way, this is the only time in the entire New Testament this particular Greek word is used. You won't find this Greek word that's used to describe Martha's scenario of being distracted. You won't find that word used anywhere else in the New Testament manuscripts. But here's what it means. It's only used once. It means to be drawn away, to be distracted, to be driven about mentally, overoccupied and too busy. Can anyone relate to that word? I'll put both hands up. This drawing away, this distraction, this overoccupation, this extreme busyness, the inability to still the mind and not be mentally driven all over the place. It drove Martha to a place where she was worried and troubled about many things. Worried and troubled about many things. But this was what her culture demanded of her. Now, it makes me think, what would that story look like today? What would that story look like today? See, today it might read that she was distracted by the need to keep up with everything happening on social media. Huh? She might be distracted by the need to keep up with everything that's happening there on social media. So social media bombards us with information we don't need, about people we don't really hang out with, about matters that don't really concern us, that ends up making us feel insecure about things we don't really need to feel insecure about. Social media is people's highlights reel. It's just the best of the best. I remember we were at um, Burley Heads a few years ago, me, Jackie, and Chloe. We were walking around the uh, Talabudra Creek there. We, we got on the wall. We went for that walk around the point to Burley. And we got around the point, and here's a, a lady and her boyfriend. And, you know, he's got the shirt unbuttoned at the top and, you know, the hair pluffing out. And, and you know, you could tell the hair had been done with everything and she's got makeup and everything. And as we slowly walked past them, he was there trying to look, just trying to look like, hey, just chilling, man. Like this, you know. And then she'd go over, no, it's not right. Look a bit more that way. So, and then she's getting herself in the picture. It was 30 minutes of adjusting and tweaking and trying. And then eventually they went snap and probably posted, you know, me and my man just chilling or something. Thinking, you weren't chilling at all. That's not chilling. You know, you took an hour to set that up. There's nothing chill about that, please. But that's what we see on social media. We see people's highlights reel. Me and, me and, and Jackie, we were doing marriage counselling about 20 years ago with a young couple that were at the point of divorce. They were basically, it's over, we can't do this, and we're sitting them down in our lounge room and we're counselling them. Every week we'd meet with them and we're talking to them and trying to sort of help them to, to, to see the, the good that was in the marriage and to not focus on the bad stuff so much and to work through some of the issues and own some stuff. We were trying to get them to do that. And then while we're doing that, at the same time, every day they're posting things on Facebook, going, oh, this is my man, I love him till the day I die. This is my woman, she's the greatest wife on earth. I mean, you guys are about to divorce. But everybody's looking at your social media going, oh, what a great marriage, you're falling apart. Social media is people's highlights reel. But the fact is it has an impact on us when we spend our whole life on it. 
looking at what people have, where they're going, and, you know, I don't know what they ate for breakfast. I don't know how people care about that, but apparently people must care enough for people to keep doing it. Look at my toast and jam. <laughs> Whatever. Now, the truth is, the real reason social media has become the massive behemoth it's become is not because someone wanted to find out about you. It's because someone wanted you to find out about them. And then to validate them with thumbs up emojis and smiles and all you know. And if you don't comment, what happens then? <gasps> Didn't you notice? Don't you like me? It's like, ah, oh, please. It's distracting. It's pulling us all over the place and making us worry about things that we shouldn't be worrying about or, or try to chase after things we shouldn't be chasing after. It's filling our heads with so much information. Today, today, it might also read that she was distracted by the manipulation and pri prioritisation of the news and the media. Maybe it would say that. Sitting at home watching the news, being told what you should be thinking about, being told what should be the greatest concern of your world right now, right? Being told that not only is this the greatest concern that you should all be worried about, but this is exactly how you should be thinking about it as well. And so our brains are being pulled, tossed and turned and flipped here and flipped there. News media tells us information we don't really need, then makes us so fearful of things that we don't really need to be afraid of. And it's exactly this kind of thing that this word distraction means. It's pulling our minds here, pulling our minds there, getting us discombobulated. I just wanted to use that word in a sermon again because I love it, discombobulated. It's constantly feeding us what they determine to be the most important events, things they think we need to be giving our attention to. It also tells us how we should be thinking about those issues. Who's the hero? Who's the villain? Etc. So when was the last time you saw a news article about the massive persecution of Christians in India? Right now, while we're sitting here today, Christians in India having their churches burnt down, pastors are being beaten and thrown in prison for no other reason than they dare to believe in the death, the burial and the resurrection of Christ and to live for him. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in Middle East nations right now. But none of that goes on the news media. So we're so worried and consumed with it. And please hear my heart here. I'm not, I'm not giving you my perspectives on stuff, but we're worried about global warming. We're worried about Russia. We're worried about all these things. And it, it, it makes me wonder, though, why are we being so distracted with all this stuff? How many of us are spending more time praying about and worrying about global events and things that are going on out there, and we barely know anything about what's happening in our own backyard and our own community? The very place that God has put us to pray for the prosperity and the blessing of our community and to reach out and to love the people that are around us, yet we're so consumed with what's going on on the other side of the world over here, over there. I just wonder, God, is, well, it was one of the beauties of the early church that they didn't have all these distractions. And they were just able to... They, see, once upon a time, you only really knew what was going on in your own town, didn't you? Our great-great-grandparents only really knew what was happening in their own town. And it just... That was enough. They didn't need to know what was going on all around the world. They couldn't solve all the problems of the world. They weren't expected to solve the problems of the world. They weren't expected to know all the problems of the world. They weren't expected to have an opinion about every problem in the world. God placed us somewhere for a season and for a reason. And they dug their roots into that community. And maybe they only had a couple of things in their life. They went to church on Sunday. They went to work. They didn't go to work for self-fulfillment. They went to work to get food and, and, and put food on the table and care about their families. That was the sense of fulfillment, was to provide for my family, not, oh, I'm bored and I like this job. I'm going to... Look, again, if you don't like your job and you get a better job, do it. I'm not having a dig at that. What I'm saying is it wasn't all about self-fulfillment. All these young people now, I just want a job that gives me self fulfillment Just get a job. Great. Just start somewhere. I mean, just take an opportunity to start a job and, and get your feet in and start going. If you sit back and wait till you've got the most life-fulfilling job, you'll probably never get a job. And mum and dad won't like that. <laughs> in the end, we find ourselves being discipled how to think and to act the same way as the rest of the culture that we live in. Notice the news never leaves you wanting to love your enemies. It never leaves you praying for those who hate you. It doesn't encourage you uh, in that. It, it never tells you that enough's enough. You've never got enough. You're always going to be told you should have more, you should know more, you should be able to go to more places, you should be more, and so on. And it doesn't ever tell us that the whole world does not revolve around us. Because every news story, this is how it's going to impact you. That's how we hook you. This is happening, but it's going to impact you. <laughs> really? <laughs> And Jesus is going, just probably not going to. Come sit with me. Today, today, and you can chuck apples at me for this one if you want. Today it might read that she was distracted by the pressure to worship and not raise her children 
in order to be seen to be a good parent. Worship our children instead of raise our children and the pressure that that puts families under nowadays. You know, kids want to play every sport available and they literally feel ripped off if mum and dad can't let them play every single sport they want. Once upon a time, there was one summer sport and one winter sport. Now, the kid wants it. And why should they be able to do it? Well, because Johnny does. Johnny's parents pay for everything and he gets to do everything. Again, if you're Johnny's parents, praise God. I, I love you and I think you, you know. But I'm just saying, I think we've got to be very careful in this culture. We're moving away from the God-given role to raise our children. We've got to be very careful we don't end up worshipping our children. Our children become the most important thing in our world, even above and beyond Jesus. I love my, my children. I would die for my children. But Jesus died for me, so my first allegiance goes to him. And I'll raise my children to the best of my ability in the ways of God, but I want them to see how important God is to me as well. I want them to understand that God is more important to me than even you are. And if I keep God in the right place, I'll be the best possible parent I can to my kids. But if I get God as second and my kids as first, everything's going to suffer. It's going to be wrong. Kids want to do whatever they want without any discipline. You know, I, 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 I feel for parents raising children these days. Back when I was a kid, I remember being sent to the office and my parents didn't care. I did something wrong. And Anyone ever get the cane when they were at school? Yeah, I know some people probably think corporal punishment, you're an evil person. Hey, I turned out okay. Right? But I remember we had this, this principle and what he used to do is you'd, put, you'd go in there, you'd put your hand out and he'd come down. He, he had a whole row of different ones and he'd flex them in front of you just to intimidate you, you know? Anyone ever have a principle like that? Yeah, he'd flex it and then you'd be sitting there sweating bullets hoping to get, get the thick one because it won't hurt us and he'd get the thinnest possible one and he'd come down and what we used to do it in, in Western Sydney when I was at school is you put your hand out and the reaction was you'd pull your hand away. Well, he was very clever. You'd pull your hand away, he'd miss. Then when you pull it away, you put it back, he'd come back up under, poof. Hit you on the back of the knuckles. Now, that's going a little too far. I'm not saying that's good. But I'm just saying I learned some things from the discipline I got as a child. It gave me some boundaries. It taught me some things. It taught me about the power of consequence. It taught me that there was right and there was wrong. It taught me that there are such things as authority figures in life and I'm not going to get away with everything as long as I want just because of who I am. At some point, there's somebody with a bit of authority is going to draw a line on the sand and go, that's inappropriate, that's not right. And I have the power to do something about it. I've got to be careful. In John 17, chapter 14 to 18, Jesus said this. He said, I've given them your word. This is his prayer for his disciples. He said, I've given them your word and the world has hated them. The world's hated them. If you've taken on the word of God, if you are following the word of God, incarnate word, Jesus, yep, there are going to be people in the world that are just not going to like you. It's just the way it is. It's part of the price. It's the cost. And he says this. For they are not of the world anymore than I am of the world. So if you're a believer in Jesus, what he's saying is you're, you're, in, you're not of the world. You're different now. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, you're now a new creation. Everything about you is new. You, you view the world different. We think, we think different. We act different. Not different for the sake of different. Because that's not to say everything, the way the world does everything is bad. It's not. But there are points of difference and we've got to be able to go, okay, that's cultural. This is kingdom culture. I've got to make the choice to go, I'd rather sit at the feet of Jesus in this moment than be running around making things just because my culture says, when kingdom culture says, this is better than that. He says they're not of the world. Then in verse 15, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world. But that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So Jesus is saying this. He's saying, you are not of the world, but I'm not, I don't want you as Christians to pull yourself out of the world because I'm sending you into the world. But I'm praying for you that while you're in the world, that you will stand for kingdom culture. You'll have the strength to stand for what you know is right in the sight of God and not bow down to culture and get caught up in every whim and, and wisp of culture. And when there comes places where kingdom culture and natural culture clash, that you would pick kingdom culture and that you would make the right decisions. How many people live in this state today, constantly worried and troubled? Jesus said to Mary, to Martha, he said, man, you are worried and troubled about many things. But then he said this beautiful statement. He said, you're worried and troubled about many things. He said, few things are needed. Indeed, only one. How simple. I, 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 love, I love the life of God because it unclutters the clutter of the world. It brings order into the chaos 
of society. It simplifies what my world is about. I don't have to run around anymore trying to work out my own identity, run around trying to justify my human existence anymore. I don't have to run around trying to, 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 to validate the reason why I'm here. God did all that for me. God has simplified my life so much. Few things are needed. Indeed, only one. I think we're in a culture that is trying to fill our minds and fill our worlds with so many things. You can survive in the many, but you will thrive in the few. Amen? We can, we, can, we can run around in survival mode with so much going on and being pulled in every way. Or we can simplify our world and look at our life and go, what areas of my life do I need to simplify? What areas of my life am I just running after this, that and the other for no other reason than the culture I live in says I have to? The culture around me says I should be. But Jesus, the one that said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest is saying, hey, come and sit at my feet. Or maybe he's saying, just stop chasing after that. Maybe he's saying, stop being fearful of this. Maybe he's saying, stop worry about that. Are you not more important to me? See, I think we're living in a culture where if we don't regularly take stock of our lives, then we'll easily find ourselves standing in the same place as Martha was. We have too much access to too much information and too many opportunities to do too many things. And we're suffering for it. And as a church, we're called to something way better than that. Jesus' response to Martha's predicament, few things are needed, indeed only one. What are those few things for you this morning? Are you surviving or thriving? What describes your world? I love that Jesus said to Mary, said that Mary had chosen. Don't miss the little words. Martha goes, why aren't you making her come out with me? And Jesus says, um, she's chosen the right thing. I love that because it empowers me. I can make a choice today. I can sit back and look at my life and I can start making some choices. I can start making some choices to walk away from and let go of this worldly culture that's training me and discipling me and controlling me and telling me that I need to be like this and I can make some choices. to go. I'm just going to simplify my life and get back to kingdom culture and start following Jesus with simplicity of heart and joy. So I wonder in this room, does anyone need to make some choice today to step back from the culture of today and step forward into the culture and the priorities of the kingdom? Jesus promised, he said, if you make that choice, he said it won't be taken away. Mary has made that choice and he said it will not be taken away from her. It's the promise of God today. You make that decision to step back from those things in culture that are pulling you all over the way and step forward into the values and the ethics and the priorities of kingdom culture. Jesus said that. That's one thing I promise you with an ironclad guarantee that will not be taken away from you. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your people, your church. Lord, I pray, uh, God, if you've been speaking to people this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just uh, highlight to people what, what it is that you want to get their attention on this morning. Father, I pray before they leave this place, before they get up and leave, I pray anything you've been speaking to them, I pray, God, that they would, uh, Lord, go and share with somebody. Go and ask someone to pray for them. Go and seal that seed in their heart, Father, that the enemy wouldn't snatch it out and take it away. God, I pray they would do business with you in this space, in this time, before they get in their car, before they turn that key, before they go and have lunch they would respond to the word of God to them. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have a good life for us, God. It's not an easy life, but it's a good life. It's not the most popular life, but it's a life that at the end of the day, we can have great assurance we will stand before you and you will look us in the eye and you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. So Father, we thank you, Lord. And God, I pray for this next seven days. Lord, uh, as we go back out there into the community, Father, would you give each of us an opportunity to bump into somebody, Lord, and to tell them how much you love them, tell them how special they are to you, God, to tell them about what Jesus did on the cross for them. God, would you give us those opportunities this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Um,